Welcome to Markets Now. I'm Michelle Rook with Kevin Dooling of KD Investors, and we're seeing some mixed trade in both grain and livestock futures this morning. Uh, Kevin, let's start off talking about the grains because we have seen the funds as relentless sellers here. You know, it's really been about the mentality that this crop is getting bigger, right? I think so. Everybody's scared of the corn crop. Everybody's scared of what the yield could be. Everybody's you know, looking at the perfect conditions with cool temps. And now the, the heat ridge that was supposed to be here in August is backed off and now it looks looks cooler. And I mean, it's it could be an ideal situation. So that, that that's hanging over the market. And you just the funds are going to continue to sell with that momentum as it hangs over the market. And if you're, you know, you're a big demand user or a big end user in this crop, you're going to sit back and wait. And there's no reason to jump yet. So, so here we are. And uh, the question is, when do we turn? When do, do we, when would we expect to turn this thing? And, uh, you know, for my seat, I, I guess technically it looks like it needs to, it's not complete yet. The pattern's not complete. So, um, we probably got a little farther to go before, before this thing is, a you know, a good candidate to make a, a, a long-term bottom in this thing. So, yeah, we're down at contract lows, though. I mean, uh, the soybean futures have hit contract lows, some three and a half year lows here in the nearby contracts. And so, you know, what are you watching in terms of support areas maybe that need to hold or technically what are you watching first in corn and soybeans? And then we'll we'll deal with wheat maybe separately. Well, in corn and corn, what I, I, I just think it needs to make one more stab at another new low, get down to new contract lows and then. You know, as far as a round number, you know, I'm really, you know, maybe we got a dip to 370, 80, somewhere in there. And that, I would think that would hold. I mean, it, it's, we've been frustrated with, you know, the cost of production going up and, and these numbers don't make sense. But, you know, I mean, these markets are famous for not making sense for seasons. And then, um, you know, that's just part of the makeup of it. So, so we'll, We'll see. I, I, I do think both corn and soybeans need to make one more new new stab down just to see what's there. Um, it would be really nice to see China move in uh, in a big way. I, I, they continue to sit on their hands pretty much. Uh, but though we're getting to that time of year where we should see them in a big way. Um, so as far as, you know, we got, we're close to that $10 support now. I mean, it that's got to have some psychological support as well. Um, so... We'll just kind of see how it shakes up. I've kind of got mid August, second week of August is a time frame when we we should have a candidate for a low in this thing. So, but I know you think that the funds maybe won't take their foot off the gas here in terms of selling pressure, maybe until the Fed gives us some indication that interest rates are going to start backing off. I think so. And we've been under this macro climate. It's it's really strange to me because it's an inflationary environment. You'd think something like a real good would hold value and it hasn't. And so they're, they're saying we have to get into a deflationary environment before we can see a change in the money flow, which doesn't make sense because we know, we know deflation is bearish for commodities. So it's, it's really silly. But um, <clears throat> from what I'm thinking, if the Fed comes out today with the minutes, or you know, suggesting that September is you know very high odds of a rate cut, then you know we've already got the dollar expecting that today. It's down 62 points, and and so maybe we can start getting some help. And from a long-term investment strategy, you know, you're looking at grains at these you know multi-year lows and and historic not historic lows, but historic support points. You would think that that would start slowing the trend following funds from putting their foot on the gas and selling it every day. So Yeah, and we do have some demand that has surfaced. I mean, we had another um, tender of corn this morning, over 4 million bushels. So we look like we're at a value level. I would think so. And when you look at our competitors, you know, Brazilian crop, I mean, they're about done with their harvest on the second crop and it didn't do very well. The Ukraine weather was horrible. So their crop's not going to do very well. So where's the extra corn going to come from? And I, I would expect a very strong year for you for U.S. corn exports. I mean, we're going to be competitive and uh, I would expect higher numbers across the board. So what about the wheat market? Let's deal with that one because we had new contract lows in December. Um, HRW wheat just yesterday, 
And that market looks like it's trying to bounce here this morning. I don't know if that's some end of month type short covering or what, but do you think that market is getting close to a bottom as well? Well, it should. You know, when I talk about the technical patterns a little bit, the wheat pattern is complete. I mean, it's done everything. It's It's got all the everything in place. And plus, I mean, the technical indicators suggest the bottom is close. Uh, we've got, you know, trouble, with, big trouble with the EU wheat crop. The Russian bids are coming back up now. Uh, demand's been good for U.S. wheat, specifically hard red spring and soft white wheat. Um, would, would be nice to see a little more hard red winter. But I, everything in my book says this market should bottom here. I mean, it should have bottomed already, but here we are. So, and if we're going to keep these low prices like this, USDA is going to have to increase the world demand because it's been in a five-year uh, stagnant point, and that doesn't make sense to have low prices with flat demand. So we've got to increase demand if that's the case. And if we increase demand, we take that, we take those uh, stocks even tighter than they're pegged to be, which is already tight. So that market's got to change here pretty quick. So yeah, we still have you know the harvest going on here, just starting on spring wheat, and harvest has been pretty slow out in your part of the country too, hasn't it? It has a little bit. We, you know, they, our part of the country, they're finding the really good yields now. As they move north, they're going to start running into some trouble where they didn't have the snow cover when the Arctic blast hit. They also had a bad freeze in June when it was pollinating. So farther north you go here, the worse it's going to get. Uh, you know, we saw the spring wheat tour results from the northern plains. They didn't really touch Montana. Um, that Montana, western Canada stuff is pretty rough. Uh, that's going to drop yields a lot. But so it's certainly going to offset some of the good yields they found in North Dakota and Minnesota, I think. So, But it's been a pretty slow harvest for you in the Pacific Northwest? Well, overall, I mean, for us personally, yes. So we had to fight fire for a week, and so it's been miserable. Um, but um, as we, And we've had a few breakdowns here and there. But I think overall it's, it's on pace for, for most of the region, but they are they – are, Still lots of lightning and, and I mean, it's been a kind of a rough, rough go here in the West. So let's put it that way. So, yeah. So Russian prices, are we competitive with them? They still seem to be getting a lot of these tenders. You know, are we competitive yet? We are. The last Egypt tender soft red winter would have been the would have been the cheapest even after shipping, but they didn't offer any. But uh, so we're definitely competitive. Um, to me, the, the cash markets have not. We're finally seeing the basis improve. And what we need to see in this market is where we see the cash market finally catch and start to pull up uh, futures versus futures having to lead the way. Because the good rallies are the ones where the cash leads. And, and you know, we're starting to see that in white wheat. We saw basis improve in hard red winter, at least off the Pacific coast. Um, it's, it's, that's what we need to see. So, so yes, I, I think so. And the cattle market, uh, let's just round out with that because it's been a choppy affair so far this week. But, you know, are we waiting for cash trade news here? Is that why we're chopping back and forth? Or are we just kind of establishing a trading range, do you think? I'd like to think we're establishing a trading range. I'd like to think this market's just going to, you know, hover where it's been the last month or two and just kind of bounce back and forth from the low to the high end of the range. That makes sense to me because it's, it's the, the funds aren't really wanting to push this thing higher, even though fundamentally we can probably argue that it should. Um, at the same time, the consumer's still, still active. And so we haven't priced them out yet. So I'd like to see it do that. I just don't trust the funds. I mean, we have that big break last fall was about 50 cents a pound. And it scares me a little bit that we could do something similar, even without the fundamental justification. So to me, I'm just kind of sitting on my hands a little bit. Do we hedge here? Do we not? Do we stay range bound? I don't know. I'm hoping we do. But like I say, common sense would say we stay range bound, but these markets don't follow common sense very often. So I know you just want cattle producers not to be complacent here though, right? Absolutely. You know, and thank goodness we got, you know, some tools out there. We've got the LRP tool to take care of that risk and uh, we can do options as well. But um, I don't like losing hedge money if I don't have to either. So, right. <laughs> so all right. Well, good to talk to you as always. Uh, Kevin dealing with KD Investors. This is Markets Now.